Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. We're, we'll be starting now. Um, today's webinar is on the U mechanism. This is a funding mechanism, or rather a series of funding mechanisms from the NIH. Uh, and these are cooperative agreements. Um, my name is Jonathan Adelist. I, I lead the business development efforts at the Freemind Group. And I will be speaking with you on this topic today. Um, before we start, I'd like to mention a few things about the, the webinar itself. Um, so generally speaking, um, the slides are available in the handout section. You can just click on that and download the slides that I'm using today. That may be useful for you. Um, anybody who is not attending at the moment but registered or uh, interested in uh, at all, anybody who registered for the webinar, I will be sending out the slides to everyone as well. And on top of that, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on our YouTube channel uh, as well. Um, any questions, if you have them, please feel free to type them in uh, to the uh, chat and I will try to address as many of them as possible towards the end of the webinar. Uh, and we, our next webinar will be on medical devices, so if that's interesting to you or to a colleague of yours or someone you know and you think they may find it useful, feel free to, to recommend that to them as well. We'd be happy to see you all um, register for our next webinar. So, all of that aside, um, let's dive in. A little bit about the Freebind Group and some background on us. So we've been around for almost 20 years now, currently about 70 full-time employees. We work across the life sciences, academic institutes, research centers, uh, and obviously the industry as well, all the way up from tiny seed stage startups and all the way up to some of the largest companies out there. Uh, at the moment, we submit over 500 applications a year. So we have amassed a pretty significant amount of expertise and experience in this specific niche. And the way we view ourselves is as a tool that you could use to really maximize your potential for this type of funding, non-dilutive funding. Um, and the way we do that is, or rather, the way that is something that can be done in general, we're just a tool that you can use to do that is by identifying the most relevant sources of funding for your research objectives, strategizing and maximizing the chance of each one of those applications and a success, managing the process itself, Sometimes, you know, there are very complex projects, uh, multi-PI, multifaceted projects. We handle all of that. We also lead the, uh, the, the process of writing the actual application. We do obviously need input from our clients, but we try to, you know, lead that and facilitate that as much as possible. And we also support final contract negotiations when relevant. And basically, we do this to, to, to make non-dilutive funding a real strategic financial tool. Um, the general pocket of money that is available um, out there uh, is currently over $50 billion a year. And that pocket of money is really, you know, comprised of various different uh, agencies and institutes. And the one we'll be discussing today is the NIH and actually a specific set of mechanisms from the NIH, as I mentioned, the U mechanisms, the U series of funding opportunities. And uh, a bit kind of in terms of a background on non-dilutive funding and the importance that non-dilutive funding can play in in the you know the endeavor of bringing a, a product to market in our space. So a few years ago, actually more than a few now, I think it was late 2012, there was a paper from uh, the the Milken Institute, and they looked into the long-term effects of raising money from these sources. And they found that obviously, you know, the value of a dollar is a dollar, but in the long term, because of the validation and because of the recognition that comes with raising this type of money, especially from the more recognizable sources, the DOD, the NIH, things like that, um, the long term value of that money is actually $8.38 in the long run for every dollar you're actually able to receive as an award. In the long run, uh, you'll be able to raise on average $8.38 in light of that. Um, another interesting fact is that uh, historically half of FDA approved drugs received government funding at some point during the course of their development. And and th there is a chicken and egg issue here to be completely honest. And you know, it, it's hard to say whether or not 
from the get-go that was great science and it was always going to be approved and it was always going to receive government funding or that the government funding was the reason that it actually made it to the finish line. And the truth is probably a little bit of both. But regardless, I think the real important take-home message here is that if you are able to join that select group of, of companies and projects that receive this type of funding, you've, you've definitely increased significantly your chances of reaching the market with that product. So, so what are U mechanisms? The way they're defined is a support mechanism used when there will be substantial federal, scientific, or programmatic involvement. Uh, and substantial involvement means that after the award, scientific or program staff will assist, guide, coordinate, or participate in project activities. Um, this is the definition from the NIH itself. And I will, I, I will say that while it's true that um, the actual involvement starts when you're awarded, we would definitely suggest, and this is something that you're going to hear more than once or twice during this talk, uh, we would definitely suggest that the involvement start much, much earlier than when you actually receive the award, even earlier than when you submit the award uh, or the, the, the application. Our suggestion is honestly to, to reach out even before you start writing the application. And um, basically, the importance of that is you mechanisms are are really, you know, each program officer has a portfolio of their U mechanisms and they care about them. They have to really meet the objectives of what, what research they want to see carried out. And it's much more personal. They're much more involved in these projects. Um, so getting them on board early, making them care about what you do and making sure even maybe emphasizing this even further, making sure the project that you suggest, the, the way it's presented, and actually, you know, the tweaking of the goals is something you can do to make sure you are really adhering to the greatest, cap you know, as much as you can to what they're actually looking for at the moment. That is really a very important component in being awarded in our experience. Um, and I'm not saying you, you can't win an award without uh, reaching out in advance, but we've found it to be very, very helpful. Um, also, uh, an important thing about this is, unlike many other NIH mechanisms, the program officer uh, with U mechanisms has a bit more leeway in terms of deciding who will actually receive the awards. So, let's say um, when you submit uh, an application uh, for, for a different mechanism, and that mechanism that uh, application receives a score that's above the pay line, it'll probably be awarded. Under the pay, pay line, probably will not be awarded. With U mechanisms, um, it has to be a very, very good application. You have to get a very good score for it to be realistic in any way, shape, or form that you're going to receive funding. But if you're close to the pay line and not quite there, um, the program officers do have the authority to prioritize your project over other ones, even if they have higher scores, so long as it's a better fit for their portfolio and what they're looking for. So again, this kind of goes back to my previous point on getting them involved and getting them excited about what you want to do and also adhering to what they're looking for in terms of the way you present it and what you're suggesting to do. All of these things really paint a picture wherein if you can get them on board, it's, it really does improve your chances of success. They have the ability to say, I like this project, even though it got a slightly lower score, I still want to fund this one and not the other one. And for that reason, it's, it's incredibly important. Um, something that's worth touching on as well, uh, the involvement, that, that sentence over there, the substantial federal scientific or programmatic involvement, that can be a bit scary sometimes, to, for, especially for for-profit companies. Uh, you know, how much are they going to intervene or make decisions for me? Uh, what will their authority over me be in, in, within my project, within my IP? Um, and and, and I, I understand that, but I think it's important to mention that they're not replacing you as the decision makers. It's really about involvement, not about taking over or making the decisions. These awards, as I mentioned, are awards that they care a lot about. The, the, as we'll discuss in, a bit further, the dollar amounts are typically higher than most other uh, awards, um, and, and they definitely want to be involved in the process, understand what's happening, not just at the end of the year when you're giving them, you know, a report on what happened, but throughout the process, you need to make a decision. They won't make it for you, but they'd like to know what the opportunity, what, what, what the options are, what you're thinking. They, they want to be part of the discussion. Again, 
not making the decisions for you. But they definitely do want to be up to date at all times. Um, the truth is, in many, many cases, clients of ours have found this to be very helpful, actually, because essentially you're getting some of the, you know, the best experts in the world to advise on what you're doing for free. Uh, that's something that in many cases can cost a, a, a pretty significant amount of money and you're, you're getting that for absolutely for free. Um, and, and that's maybe a, a better way to look at this because again, I, I, I recognize the fact that looking at a sentence like uh, substantial federal involvement can be a deterrent. And I, uh, as I said, I understand that, but it's important to put it in context in my opinion. Um, these funding mechanisms fund pretty much all stages of development. There are uh, U mechanisms that fund discovery work, and there are U mechanisms that fund late stage clinical trials. But I think it's fair to say, generalizing, that they typically go a bit towards the later end of the spectrum with U mechanisms. Usually, there are, as I mentioned, for some, some U mechanisms for discovery work, but most of them you'll see are for preclinical and even clinical activities most of the time. Um, and also, worth mentioning, success rates with U-mechanisms, um, they are typically quite a bit higher than with other mechanisms. If you look at kind of the, the, the there are different types of U-mechanisms, and we'll dive into that in a second. But if you look at the success rates in, in the various different U-mechanisms, you'll, you'll typically see that they're, on average, about 10 points higher than the general averages. So if, if the general NIH averages are usually let's say, in, 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 usually in the teens, sometimes low 20s. Uh, so for you mechanisms, they're usually in the 20s, sometimes even low 30s. Um, so, so that's also a very significant difference and, and an important one. Uh, there are quite a few different types of U mechanisms, and I'm giving you a, a few examples here of, of some of the more common ones. Um, U ones are you know, a research project cooperative agreement, it's basically the equivalent of an R01 in terms of scope, in terms of budget. Sometimes th th there's no budget cap here, unlike R01s, which are typically capped. But regardless, it's very similar. Uh, there are U41, U42s. Uh, these are STTRs, similar to the R41 or R42, which is the same uh, code for, for, for regular STTRs, not the cooperative STTRs. Um, U43, U44 is pretty much the same thing, but with SBARs and not STTRs. And um, UH2, UH3, and sometimes it would be a UG3, UH3. These are phased agreements, kind of like an, a, a fast track SBAR where you start, you submit one application, and then you start with the phase one, you receive the phase one. As soon as you complete the phase one, you automatically start receiving the phase two. Um, also similar, let's say, to an R21, R33. Uh, and this this type of mechanism, the, the difference between a UH2 as the first phase or a UG3 as the first phase is, is, is more than anything else, just the scope of the funding. Usually they'll use a UG3 when it's larger scale funding. So when should you submit a U application? Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, the scope is very important. It has to be a very good fit for what they're looking for. Uh, while many of the, if, if you, you know, if you read the call for applications, um, you'll see that in many cases it's fairly broad, and that's fine. Um, but just being a fit for the general guidelines that are issued in the call for applications, in many cases, is not really enough to ensure you have a real chance at receiving the award. So again, and I'll repeat this quite a few times, I'll try, I'll try to minimize it, but at this point it really does, uh, and it has to be mentioned here, um, make sure you're within scope of what they're looking for. Talk to them, um, discuss it with them, receive their feedback, incorporate it if you can or if you want to, uh, and, and, and make sure you know you really are submitting something that has a real chance of winning. Um, and that's the, actually I, I kind of touched on the second point there uh, while discussing the first one. Um, and also uh, make sure, you know, basic research, translational sciences, as I mentioned, there is funding for all stages. Make sure it's a good fit again for what they're looking for with this specific funding mechanism. Um, how to, 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 to construct a U application. So I, I'm going to skip the first point because I think I've, I've emphasized that point enough. Um, in terms of specific aims, there, there are basically two types of specific aims in an application. There could be discrete specific aims, mean, meaning 
specific aim one, specific aim two, and specific aim three. We're going to start working on each one of them. They're, they all come together um, to, to, to create, you know, a, a value at the end of the project, but they're not necessarily things that are sequential. They're not uh, riding on each other. For, to, you know, you don't have to start one, finish it, and then with the results of that, start working on the second specific aim. That is actually the second option, which is sequential. Both of them are possible, but again, you have to make sure that the specific funding mechanism, the specific program officer and what they're looking for, it's, you have to make sure it's a good fit for, for them at that point. Um, when necessary, make sure, you have, make sure you have the right collaborations in place, uh, partnerships. If there's a skill set that you're missing to really make sure it's a well-rounded application and, and the project is really, you know, all facets of that project are covered, then definitely go out and find collaborators or partnerships that will make sure that that is the case and you have everything covered. Um, virtuality is accepted in, in, in most cases, which is interesting because there are obviously other mechanisms where uh, you have to carry out a portion of the work in-house. In the vast majority uh, of uh, situations with U mechanisms, that's not an issue at all. Um, this is something that's very important to note. You, you can, you know, outsource to CROs, to academic labs that you're collaborating with. You don't necessarily have to do anything in-house in most cases, and that can be something that's that's very important for virtual companies. Um, and obviously, and this is true for most uh, applications, but obviously the more complex the application is, and you mechanisms are rather hefty documents, um, it's very important to, to, to adhere to the, the, the instructions of that solicitation. Um, so what I'd like to do now is start with uh, giving you a few examples of different funding mechanisms. Um, I've chosen specific mechanisms in, in, in spaces that usually tend to use U mechanisms a lot. There are various different ones, and I'll give kind of a, a short list at the, after I've given the, the examples that I've, I'm going to dive into a bit deeper. I'll also give a list of other ones that, that we find relatively uh, useful for our clients. Uh, that being said, there are dozens of U mechanisms, and I'm not going to review them all or even m mention nearly all of them. Uh, so, by all means, I encourage you to go on the NIH website and search for them and find something. If there's not something that I'm going to discuss here that's a good fit for what you want to do, go ahead and look for that. There very well could be. Uh, so I'll start with oncology first. And this is a this is PAR seventeen one twenty nine uh, quantitative imaging tools and methods for cancer response assessment. Uh, basically, this is designed to fund clinical translation of already optimized uh, imaging software and tools uh, that are capable of really measuring and predicting response of cancer to therapies. Um, usually, uh, sometimes also translating imaging tools for for planning or validation of radiation therapy, things like that. Um, Basically, the, the award here would be uh, up to 2.5 million over a period up to, of up to five years. This is from the NCI, obviously, the National Cancer Institute. Uh, the next deadline is right around the corner. It's September 12th. To be honest, if you have not started working on it, I do not consider that to be a realistic deadline. No matter how uh, good you are at putting things like this together, it would be a real challenge. Um, for that reason, I added the following deadline here, which is January 9th, and I think that's probably a much better fit in terms of, you know, putting together a, an application that has a real chance of being awarded. Um, in infectious diseases, the example I wanted to bring, or actually, I, I think there, there are a couple here. Uh, first of all, this is a relatively broad one. Uh, this is called the, the NIAID Clinical Trial Implementation Cooperative Agreement. Um, this is a U01. The previous one, as, I, as, as you noted, uh, was also uh, a U01. Or rather, maybe I failed to note that, but it is a U01. Um, this one it has no budget cap. Um, and that being said, you, you know, don't ask for too much. It, it has to be realistic. If there's a clinical trial that costs $60 million, and you look at the history of what they've funded in the past, and they haven't really spent more than, I don't know, Eight million uh, on on an application like this uh, in the last five years, then don't ask for sixty. Um, that being said, this is something that's very very open in terms of the scope. It's basically funding for clinical trials 
that are of interest uh, to the to NIAID in, in terms of what they're interested in. And basically, NIAID covers everything that's allergies, infectious diseases, autoimmune. So it, it's, you know, it's, it's very broad. Um, if you have a clinical trial that's really addressing, obviously, an unmet medical need, something that is a priority to NIAID, um, this could be a very good fit for that. And they also have an SBIR. Uh, that is here, you see up, up there, a U44. Um, and this is uh, basically, for, in terms of the scope of, of the type of trial that it would cover, it's very similar. Here there's a budget cap because it's an SBAR. Almost all SBARs have the same budget cap. Uh, and this would be a fast track, so it would be 1.5 million for the phase one, for the, excuse me, uh, 225,000 for the phase one, 1 1.5 million for the phase two. Um, but um, they specifically state here that that number can be exceeded uh, uh, on topics that are uh, uh, within the, the list of topics that, can, uh, that are eligible to receive a waiver for the budget. Um, that is actually always true. So the fact that they specifically state that within the solicitation here means in our experience that they, they you know, they're much more open to that happening uh, because in any SBAR, if you're on the list of topics, you can ask to exceed the budget, but you definitely have to, you know, go through the proper procedures to do that. You contact them in advance, make sure it's okay. And I've added the link here to that uh, list of topics. I will say that specifically in infectious diseases, it's a very comprehensive list. So chances are that many of the people listening here today, if they are engaged in, in research in, in infectious diseases or in allergies or in autoimmune diseases, there's a pretty good chance that your topic could be on the list. So it's definitely worth looking into. Um, the deadlines here are exactly identical, September 13th and January 14th. Uh, so again, not realistic, uh, in my opinion, to submit September 13th. I would definitely aim for January 14th as the next deadline. Neuroscience is one of the spaces, and specifically maybe the NINDS, worth mentioning, um, because technically neurosciences could be uh, funded by other uh, institutes as well. Uh, Alzheimer gets a lot of funding from the National Institute on Aging, things like that, and that's definitely neurosciences. Um, but specifically, the NINDS really heavily utilizes the U mechanism, probably more so than any other uh, institute within the NIH. Uh, so the, the, I'll give a few examples here, and then I'll also give you a short list of additional ones within the neuroscience space because there are so many. Um, so the first one I want to discuss here is the BPN, the, the Blueprint Neurotherapeutics Network. Um, this is for a small molecule drug discovery uh, and development of disorders of the nervous system. Um, no budget cap here. Uh, this is a UG3 UH3, so it's a phased award, as I mentioned earlier when I gave the description of the types of mechanisms. The deadline here is February 9th. And basically the real things that you need to understand when, when deciding whether or not this is the right mechanism to use, first of all, obviously it has to be a small molecule in this case, uh, no biologics, anything like that. Uh, it's for advancement into the clinic. So it's uh, mostly d discovery, development, and, and, and they really kind of give a very good description. So I'll just read it verbatim. Projects can enter either at the discovery stage to optimize promising hit compounds through medicinal chemistry, or at the development stage to advance a development candidate through IND-enabling studies and phase one clinical testing. So it's basically either starting that are discovery and moving into the development toward the clinic, or starting uh, with development and moving into the phase one and getting funding for both of those two phases. So the first phase would be either discovery and then the second phase would be um, through medicinal chemistry, or the phase one would be development and the phase two would be the, the phase one clinical trial. Um, regardless, no matter what, the endpoint needs to be at least submitting an IND. And um, this mechanism also has an SBAR equivalent, a U44. So I gave you the example of the UG3 UH3, but there is also a very, very similar, actually identical U44. Uh, the Create Bio uh, track is, is interesting. This is the development track, actually, for, for, within Create Bio. Um, this is for non-clinical and early phase clinical development 
for biologics. Again, so similar stages of development, uh, preclinical and, and early clinical. Um, and this is actually an SBAR, uh, U44. Although, this, if you'll see at the bottom, this also has a U01 equivalent. So it wouldn't be a UG3, UH3. It would be a U01. Um, but regardless, there is an SBAR and a non-SBAR mechanism, which is something that you'll see with the NADS um, fairly often. Um, this, though, the reason I brought this specific example of an SBAR is because when I mentioned earlier that the vast majority of SBARs all adhere to the same cap, because the, 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 that's a technical cap that's not... For, uh, the, NDA, the NIH does not put that cap in place. That's a cap on SBARs in general. Um, here, when issuing this funding mechanism, they got authorization to completely exceed that. So the funding here, uh, th there's a phase one and a phase two here as well. It's a fast track, um, but the phase one is up to two years, which is m much, much longer than the phase one of, an, of most SBARs, and it's up to $1 million a year. And then the phase two here is up to three years, and it's $1.5 million a year. So that's in total up to $6.5 million, which is <laughs> the equivalent usually of five or six SBARs. So it's, it, it's a very, very uh, large SBAR. Um, and this is intended to, to fund development of therapeutic uh, biotechnology projects and biologics for disorders identified under the NINDS mission. Th th that is very broad, and that's on purpose. Uh, they want to leave space to make a decision and be excited about a specific project. So obviously, you know, it has to be interesting to the program officer. It can't be in a disease they, they just really don't care about. But um, they're not really confining themselves to, to a specific type of disease, besides the fact, obviously, it has to you know, be of interest to, not, to the NINDS, so neurological, uh, stroke, things like that. Um, basically, CNS, PNS related. Um, and this would be IND enabling studies and phase one in terms of the funding. Uh, and again, it should end at least with an IND. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this also has a U01 equivalent. Deadline here is February 13th. So you definitely have time uh, to submit this, but uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not a simple application to put together. So I would definitely suggest at least very seriously considering starting to work on it very soon. Um, additional neurosciences opportunities, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, the NINDS really relies heavily on new mechanisms. So there's Neuronext, uh, there's the, the StrokeNet, uh, the Brain Initiative. Um, there's a general mechanism for clinical trials, a, a U1 that's different from the other ones I mentioned because, as, as you saw earlier, it was either for biologics or for small molecules. Uh, this, the, one I'm, uh, I'm, the example I've given here, the bottom one, uh, is actually completely agnostic even in that sense. So it's, it's completely open in terms of what the trial would be on, um, besides the fact that it has to be interesting to the NINDS. So there are a lot of different options here, and it's really worth looking into, especially if you're in neurosciences. But also, as I mentioned, there are various other examples, and here are a few of them. So NIAMS has a, a clinical trial implementation uh, cooperative agreement. NIAMS is arthritis in musculoskeletal and skin diseases. Um, they do orthopedics, they do various different things, wound healing, um, regenerative medicine innovation project, uh, the BRP, the Bioengineering Research Partnerships uh, from the NIBIB is interesting. It's, it's pr pretty much everything that has to do with um, engineering aspects of biologically relating projects. So, it, you know, medical devices, things like that, many, in many cases, use this mechanism. Uh, the NIDCD has a similar mechanism as well. Uh, the NIDCD is deficit in communication disorders. Um, NIDDK is National Institute of Digestive, uh, uh, digestive uh, Diabetes, Digestive Disorders, and Kidney Diseases. Uh, and again, they all have U01 mechanisms that could be used to fund clinical trials. So as, as you see, opposed to many NIH grants that can be for relatively early stages of development. There is a lot out there for preclinical and clinical activities here. There are also U mechanism applications or, or, or grants within the U series that could definitely fund earlier stage work. You saw there was one that, that I gave uh, the example of that also could fund discovery work, and there are others. Uh, but the emphasis here is moving forward in the process and it's supporting projects like that as well. For that reason, as you saw, the dollar amounts are much more than what you would see with your standard kind of run-of-the-mill SBAR or, or other grants that are that are a bit 
No, nothing to shake a stick at, but there could be definitely smaller dollar amounts than the ones we're discussing now. Um, looking at really the way to take all of this and make it a real strategic source of funding, and this is kind of summarizing, and I, I hope I've given you a good taste of the fact that there really are some interesting mechanisms out there. And again, I clearly I couldn't cover the dozens and dozens of specific mechanisms that are out there, but I tried to give you a taste here. And I hope if you haven't found something that's really good fit for you, at least I've incentivized you to go ahead and, and, and look around uh, on their website and find hopefully something that is. Uh, but regardless, to kind of bring it all back together, I want to touch on how these applications are reviewed, how they decide who, who's awarded. And I, I initially started by saying that you know there's a lot more leeway for the program officers in this case. That's all very true. But still, how uh, to really maximize the chances of you being awarded. So first of all, it starts much earlier than that. It's, it's really how do you maximize your potential as a company to raise this type of funding? And, and, and the first way is to, to prioritize it. Um, in many cases, a lot of companies are used to going to VCs, IPOs sometimes, angels, things like that. And, and we found that, that you know, non-dilutive funding, while it's a great tool, and if you look at you know, the pocket of money I mentioned earlier, $50 billion annually, that's a pocket of money that's probably larger than the entire VC community put together in terms of what they invest in biotech. Um, but it's still not viewed as, as a, a standard part of a, a portfolio of, of how to raise funding. Um, and we contend it really should be. Um, and the way to really move that forward uh, is uh, st start by lowering the risk. Uh, you have to know your weaknesses, address them in the application, show them you know what some possible pitfalls would be and how you're going to address them. How you, At the end of the day, the, there is a risk management process here. They, they're not investing in you to, 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 you know, to turn a dime on it, but they're definitely, you know, they have a finite amount of funding and they want to give it to the projects that will have the most impact and have the most chances of success. So there's still a lot of risk management. It's just a different set of glasses when conducting that type of risk management. They're looking for slightly different things and they're weighing things a bit differently than an investor, but it's there is still definitely a, a risk management process. Uh, and the way to address that, as I mentioned, is, is, is addressing your weaknesses as I also mentioned earlier, finding the right partners when necessary, um, understanding what they're looking for, what they need, what the unmet medical needs are in general, and also what the priorities of the specific funder are. Um, don't skimp over uh, the administrative aspects. While obviously they are less important than the core science, you know, this is also a bureaucratic organization. It's part of the government. Applications have been disqualified for very, you know, it's just, it's, 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 a, it's a horrible thing when it happens, when, you know, you just disqualified for a reason that has nothing to do with the fact that you have fantastic science. So make sure, you, you know, all your, your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed. And also try to establish yourself as a top researcher and also an experienced manager. They want to know you have the scientific team in place, but they also want to, want to see that you have the management in place to make sure you can really bring it to the finish line. Um, the way we do this is we start by really creating a full map of everything that could be relevant. A full report on anything that could be relevant for any of the projects that a client that comes on would have in their pipeline in any different direction, even that each one of those projects could be taken in different indications, different angles, ancillary studies, anything that they may be considering to do. We map out everything that could be relevant for each one of those sets of activities. We take that and we translate it into a multi-submission strategy by basically incorporating things like the company's priorities and strategy because you know the, that general list is, is a fantastic tool to have but that you know that that's, that alone is nothing that you can really act on because you, you have to know what's more important what can be what needs to be now what can be later um so we definitely incorporate all those aspects and use those to translate the, the report into an actual strategy and then act on the strategy and produce the actual applications and, and obviously producing as many applications as possible while making sure each one of those applications is truly maximized in terms of fit for the source of funding and the quality of the application to truly maximize chances of an award. Um, so that's pretty much a summary of both the topic and then how we approach it. Uh, at this point in time, uh, I, I think I'll go through some of the questions, and if you have any additional questions that you haven't typed out, please feel free to do that now. Okay. 
I'm just going through the questions here. So first of all, I'll, I'll say that um, I'll try to address any questions here that are general and uh, that I think the answer could be interesting to all the attendees. Uh, but you know, some specific questions uh, I'll probably try to answer through email. And if you also want to ask me a, a specific question, uh, my email is now on the screen. So feel free to reach out and ask me any question. Um, happy to discuss if that's relevant. Let me just go go ahead here. And okay, so so the first question, uh, so this is actually an interesting question and something I didn't touch on at all. Um, is, and this question is basically, uh, can non-US organizations apply? And uh, the, the answer is yes and no, it depends on the funding mechanism. Um, usually for UO1s, uh, UH2, UH3s, UG3, UH3s, uh, the answer would be usually yes. Uh, U43, U44, U41, U42, uh, the SBIRs and STTRs basically, those are for small businesses, small US businesses. So in those cases, the answer would be no. That being said, as you saw, in many of the cases, uh, there would be a similar mechanism with a, a uh, an SBIR equivalent and a non-SBIR equivalent. So in most cases, um, even if there is an SBIR that's relevant, there would probably be a non-SBAR equivalent that you could submit. Let's see here, okay. All right, one, one additional question is about our financial model. I'll, I'll, you know, there are a lot of specifics here, so I won't dive in too deep, but generally speaking, we work on a, on, on a combination of an upfront fee and an award fee. Uh, we, we, most most of our, our, our the fees are award fees, but we do charge a bit upfront as well. And, and uh, happy to discuss the specifics with anybody who's interested. Obviously, it depends on the scope of the relationship, the type of organization, things like that. So there's no one answer to that question. Um, but generally speaking, it's it's kind of a combination of, of upfront and award fees. Um, let me see if there's anything else here. There are, there are a couple of very, very specific questions, and as I mentioned, I'll just try to answer those by email. Okay, I think that, that, that that's good enough. Uh, thank you all for attending. It was a pleasure speaking with you today, and I look forward to, to seeing you in our future webinars.